Thank you very much for this beautiful item. And uh, now we'll have, we'll ask Brother Peter to come forward and uh, continue the presentation. Once again, this afternoon, we continue our study on the spirit of prophecy. Now, when you think of, first of all, for a moment, as we go to the omega of apostasy, when you hear the word omega, what does omega mean to you? Why? Okay, it is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So you have in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I am the alpha, which is the beginning, and the... Omega. So when you think of the omega of apostasy, what do you think of? It's the last. It's the end, isn't it? Now, there have been quite a few descriptions of the end. I've heard many things on what is the omega of apostasy. And in this context here, we're talking about the omega of apostasy in Adventism. Now, when we think of the omega of apostasy among Adventist circles, and sometimes we have a tendency to limit it to one group or another. If we can identify the omega of apostasy, and if I'm doing that, I don't care where you're at, you're an omega of apostasy, okay? You can say all you want, I'm over here, or I'm over there, I'm exempt, nope. If you fit the description, then it's time to change if you want to be saved. And I hope that we are interested in the plan of redemption. Now I want you to, before we get to the omega of apostasy, I want us to go back a little bit to the experience of the Hebrew people. In 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 12 to 13, this is now getting to the end of the book of 2 Kings, which is coming to the end of the history of Judah. Uh, the, the people of Israel, they were already in captivity by this time. It says here, talking about this people, for they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. What happened? People went into apostasy. <coughs> that happened from time to time, quite often in the history of Israel. Now, what happened when Israel found themselves in apostasy? What happened next? What would God do? Send them a prophet. Yeah? So apostasy yields the need for a prophet. That's consistent in the history. You look at it from the very beginning of time. Now, how did these sin-loving leaders react towards these messages of the prophets when the prophet discovered to them their real condition? Now, sometimes people don't like their condition. Imagine working on a very hard day. You've been doing this work and you've got grease and everything else all over your face and everything else. And you're walking in public and someone says, hey, your face is dirty. What do we do? Go wipe it off or we get rid of the messenger. We gotta give him, he's in trouble. That person told me this bad thing. We better get rid of that person. Is that what we do? Sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we realize there's a problem here, and I'm going to go wash my face. Now, what happened here over and over again, notice verse 14 to 17, notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers and did not believe in the Lord their God. Now, by the way, who spoke to them? Who spoke to them? Uh, who spoke to them directly? The prophet. So here, the prophet says, this is your condition. 
They rejected the prophet, and what God says here, they did not believe in the prophet. Is that what it says? No. Is that what it says? No. It says what? They did not believe in the Lord their God. In other words, when God sends a prophet, you reject the prophet, you're not rejecting the prophet. Who are you rejecting? You're rejecting God. And they rejected not only the prophet, or God through the prophet, they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. They began acting like the heathen. They began to assimilate to the nations around them. They became the same material. I remember years ago going to Orlando, Florida for the very first time. There were some interested people there, and I went there for a visit. We had no members at the time there. And I went to visit Orlando, Florida, and I was shocked. I just come from the good Bible Belt in Nashville, Tennessee. That's where I lived. And uh, there, you know, they, they try to keep things in order. And I went to Orlando, and it's like, what kind of a street is this? This is wickedness. Billboards, everything. Like, this is horrible. What is this, Sodom or what? You know, and I, drove, I went there, and I began preaching to this group of people, and I told them about how wicked Orlando is. And they said, what? What are you talking about? I said, yeah, don't you see anything? Like, we, don't, we don't see anything. What had happened to them? They became desensitized. They did not even see. When I went there, Orlando, it was the same reaction when I first drove into Harlem <laughs> and into the Bronx. The very f I, it was exactly the same reaction. And people living in that environment, they became desensitized. And these people in Israel, what happened? They became desensitized. And if that was not enough, they began to act just like the heathen around them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images. Can you imagine? Even two calves and made a grove and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. Who was this? <laughs> Excuse me. Who was this? In other words... God's people, God's church. Now, God's church now is having what? These two calves. They began having groves. They began to worship what? The host of heaven. Yeah. And today, you know, we do the same things. You know, we start little by little introducing the uh, worship of baby of Semiramis, you know, Tammuz on the 25th day of December. And... Uh, you know, worshiping the goddess of the moon and goddess of the sun. And, you know, we start adapting all these heathen holidays. And little by little, we're saying, oh, but we're going to put a little bit of sprinkling of Christianity in them. And then we can bless it and say, now this is holy. And that's no different than the heathen back in those days. And what happened next? And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire. Now, we don't need to have our sons and daughters pass through the fire. We just simply call it legalized abortion. It's the same thing. Because back then, all they did is they took the little baby after it was born. They stuck it in Moloch's arms over there, and he burned and died. The end result was the same. So whether you do an abortion or whatever else it is, it's the same thing. And we're seeing this in the so-called Christian nation. We are seeing this thing over and over again. And it's sometimes even affecting some of us. When we start talking about abortion, I hear some people saying, oh, I understand this circumstance, and I understand that circumstance, and all I can think of is Moloch. And then what? And used divinations and enchantment and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. This is the history of Israel. When they rejected the prophets, they ended up all like this. And what happened when they continued to reject the message that God gave them through the prophets? 
Verse, chapter 17, verse 18 to 20 of 2 Kings. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So the whole nation of Israel, ten tribes were wiped out because of these things. Judah was left. Now verse 19. Also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel which they made. So Judah began acting like their neighbors. And so what happened? Verse 20. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of the spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. And the end result was the Babylonian captivity. You read that. It's right after that. You want to be with Babylon? You want to? You like Babylon so much? Fine, go into Babylon. That's what Babylon will do to you. And many times, uh, young people I find having a real serious struggle, especially dealing with worldliness. They, they, the world looks so attractive to them, and then they go and uh, they go into the world and find what? It bites you like a snake. There's no peace there. You're not going to find that peace you're looking for. The world doesn't accept you anyway. You go into the world, I see so many young people, they finally they decide to go into the world and what happens? The world rejects them. Why? Because we don't belong there. And this is what happened there. So what happened? They became like the world, and what does the world do? Put you into captivity. You want to be a slave? You want to be a slave for the rest of your life? That's it. What was the reason? Why was it that Israel, both the northern ten tribes, the kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom of Judah, why is it that they perished? It's very simple. Proverbs 29, verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. If we don't pay attention to the visions of the prophets, the people perish. Do you want to perish? Or do you want prosperity? Now stop and think about this. When the children of Israel left Egypt, how did they leave Egypt? What was there for them in their departure from Egypt? I really want you to pay attention to Hosea chapter 12 and verse 13. And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet was he preserved. How did God bring Israel out of Egypt? By what? A prophet. And in the wilderness wanderings, how do you survive the wilderness wanderings? By what? By the prophet. That's very important. The scriptures contain a record all the way through from the beginning of those who accepted and those who rejected the voice of the prophets. Just take your Bible out. Start with Genesis. Read from Genesis to Revelation. And especially as we're approaching the close of time, as we're approaching the end of this world's history, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, after talking about the Hebrew people in the wilderness, it says, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples. The word in sample here is the word type, if you look in your margin. All these things happen as an, a type. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Do we really believe that the end of the world is coming soon? Do we really believe that? Let's stop and analyze that. I want you to analyze it for yourself because all of us say we're living in the last days. We're getting bigger houses, bigger cars, bigger lifestyles, bigger paychecks, better jobs, everything else. We're living in the last days. Let's evaluate our own life's history. Where are we going? Now, I just want to ask you a question. What is the final test that comes to the world? What's the final test? Y'all know what the final test is? Last test in the world. What is it? About the commandments of God specifically, what is it? 
the Sabbath Sunday controversy, right? We're all familiar? That's the final test that comes. Now, one thing that we often make a mistake, we look at the final test is the Sabbath Sunday issue. And so we say that the Sabbath test is future. Isn't that what we say? But I want us to stop and think a little bit. The Sabbath test is future for whom? The world who didn't know. For the world who didn't know. For those of us who know, how long has been the Sabbath the test? Since the first church, the first was convicted on. But as a people since 1844. You read that in early writings uh, all over the place. That the Sabbath is a present test, not future test. And we as Adventists always thought, Sabbath, future test. You know, the Sabbath is the test in the future for those who do not know it. You read those final warnings. It's to those people who did not understand the third angel's message. That's where the latter rain goes to. It doesn't go to us who know and understand it. You see, there are two final tests. There's a final test for the world, and there's a final test for Adventism. Did you know that? And when we talk about the final test, the last test, what do you call the last? What's the word you would use for the last? Omega. So when you think of the final test, the final apostasy, we're talking about the omega. And what is the very last test for us as an Advent people? It's very simple. I want to read it to you. There it is. It's very plain. After the final one, there is no more, correct? Correct? After the last one, there's no more, okay? So now, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 48. Very important statement. And in all the different studies on the omega of apostasy, I never heard this statement read. Not one. They describe all sorts of things in the omega of apostasy, but never this one. But look, brethren, this is very clear. The very last deception. The very what? Last. Very last. Is there another one after this one? So the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimonies of the Spirit of God. So let me ask you a question. What is the omega of apostasy? To make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. That's it. Now, it does not say rejection. <laughs> Notice here. It does not say rejection. It's to make it of none effect. That's the last deception. So when we're talking about the omega of apostasy, we're talking about making the writings of the spirit of prophecy of none effect. Is that clear for everyone here? That's clear? There is nothing after that. That means it is the omega. Doesn't, nothing else comes after that. Now, when we're talking about the, the uh, omega or, or, or the last deception, it's not to reject, as we mentioned, it's to make it of none effect. And how do we hear that? Oh, that's not intended for us. That's really not intended for this time. That was back in her day. <coughs> Another one that I've seen over and over again. And the worst thing is, I see it in books published under her name is they make a statement and then they put dot, 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 dot. And sometimes I read the dot, 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 dot in its original and I find the exact opposite of what it says. All you have to do, read another sentence and it puts it in its context, taken totally out of its context. Another method is putting a subtitle there. And the subtitle has exactly the opposite. Or the worst was a title. One day, someone showed me a Review and Herald article. And it was one of the very last Review and Herald articles in those six books. 
and I looked at the article. Wow, pretty strong article. Clearly against us as a people. You read the article, you look at the title, you look at the article. The article itself I had no problem with, but the title of the article and a little description made it appear straightly against us as a people. And I thought to myself, you know, this is quite interesting. I read so many other things, but this one here is, this is really strange, you know? So I was looking at it, and I was praying to the Lord, Lord, what do you mean by this? Because if I, if I read this like this, I mean, something's going to happen. And then somehow my eye got down to the date, and it's like 1954 or something. I said, she's dead by then. How did this end up in here? So I thought, let me go to the original. So I went, uh, at that time I was living in Maryland, so White Estate was not that far away, and I found the original article. No title and no first paragraph. The title skewed the way you read it. You know, brethren, those are ways in which we misapply or make of none effect the testimonies of the Spirit. And of course, we make it of none effect even more by not reading it. Isn't that? We just don't read it. So now, let us look at the Omega of apostasy. In Book 1 of Selected Messages, page 200, it, the Omega of apostasy actually had its beginning in the 20th century by Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. Now, we mentioned John Harvey Kellogg a little bit earlier. That was when he was still faithful to the spirit of prophecy. And now notice what she says. In the book, Living Temple, there is presented the alpha of deadly heresies. So that's just the beginning of it. The omega will follow and will be received by those who are not willing to heed the warning God has given. So here, he is beginning the alpha, and when you go through the alpha, those seeds end up in the omega. But you still got an alphabet to go through, don't you? So it's going all the way through that process. Now, on volume one, page 197 of Selected Messages. 197, just a little bit before here. So the other one was page 200. So it is with many among our people who have drist, drifted away from the old landmarks and who have followed their own understanding. What a great relief it would be to such could they quiet their conscience with the belief that my work is not of God. How many people would be really happy, their conscience would be really smooth if they actually believed her work is not of God. But your unbelief will not have changed the facts in the case. Belief or unbelief, it doesn't matter. It's still going to be there. The facts are. The fact is what? You are defective in character, in moral and religious experience. Close your eyes to the fact, if you will, but this does not make you one par particle more perfect. The only remedy is to wash in the blood of the Lamb. Too many times we're trying to ease our conscience. Today, people ease their conscience by going to psychiatrists. They take medications to ease their conscience. When all they have to do is confess their sins. And some confessions are before God alone. Some confessions are to our neighbor, to our family members, to our it may be public, it may be private, whatever it is. That's how you deal with an e uh, uneasy conscience. Not a bit of medications. In the old days, they didn't go to a psychiatrist. It was much cheaper. They just go down to the local pub, drink it away, and they're gone. You know, they don't have to worry about it. That was their method of dealing with it. But it doesn't deal with it. It keeps getting worse. Just because someone takes some drugs and knocks them out for the next day, you know, because they have a bill due, uh, the next morning, guess what? When they, they come back to their conscience, the bill is still there, plus the bill for their drugs. And now it becomes worse, so what do they do? They got to get more drugs. It doesn't change things. So the same thing, getting rid of the spirit of prophecy does not change our character. What changes our character is reading the spirit of prophecy and confessing our sins like we need to. Now, when we talk about history, in Volume 5, Testing for the Church, page 66, it talks about the history in Israel. Because remember, we're talking about the wilderness sojourn. It says here, if you seek to turn aside the counsel of God to suit yourselves, if you lessen the confidence of God's people and the testimonies he has sent them, you are rebelling against God as certainly as were Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. 
So the work of Korah, Dathan, the Byram is the work of anyone who lessens in any way the testimonies of the Spirit of God. So if you are going to a place which is constantly lessening the testimonies in the Spirit of God, know that you're in the camp of Korah, Dathan, the Byram. And if you don't get out of the camp of Korah, Dathan, the Byram, what's going to happen? Remember, the earth eventually opened up and swallowed up that camp. Now, do you want to be on the camp on the side of the prophet, which was Moses? By a prophet, he brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet, was he preserved? Or do you want to be with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Where do you want to go? I don't know about you, but I really want to go to heaven. You know, I really don't want to live in this world. You know, I, I enjoy some places in this world. I enjoy visiting some places, and I've enjoyed living in several places in this world. But you know what? This is not my home. I am not interested in spending eternity in a place like this. I really am not. And it, until we all get serious about being pilgrims and strangers here, that this is not our home. Something has to break one day. And it starts with the testimonies of the Spirit of God. And it starts about making sure that we're not supporting Korah, Dath, and the Byron. And if you want to notice, in Israel in the wilderness, the majority was the supporting Korah, Dath, and the Byram. Did you notice that? The majority. Ten spies were with Korah, Dath, and the Byram. The entire leadership. Can you imagine the entire leadership was with Korah, Dath, and the Byram? And you talk about the Levites, the priesthood. The actual priest, obviously, was with Aaron, and, and they had only a few priests. But how many Levites were with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Matter of fact, Korah was a Levite. He was a Kohathite. He was a cousin of Moses. And we don't have time to go through that. But those of you who like to, on the same website, we do have the uh, Aaron's Rod. There's a whole history of that on the Reformation series. You can go through that, and we get a little bit more in detail on the history of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So this is why when we're talking about the relationship that we have to the writings of Ellen G. White, to the prophet that God has given us, it is so dangerous when we start disregarding it. Now, when we talk about the cause, what is the cause of rejecting Christ as our leader? Many of you have read this statement in volume 5, page 217. It was written in the year 1882, six years before Minneapolis. Now, I want you to notice here, and we often read the one sentence, and we stop. We stop with the first sentence. The church has turned back from following Christ, her leader, and is steadily retreating towards Egypt. That is a historical fact. However, if we don't read a bit further, we're doomed to repeat history. And what does it say? I'm not interested in the fact that the church is retreating towards Egypt. But that's not my interest. My interest is why. Why is it? What is the cause? And notice here. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power. So what was going on in the church in 1882? A lack of what? Spiritual power. Are you having a lack of spiritual power? Is there weakness in your spiritual life? Well, then what is the cause? Notice here. Doubt and even disbelief of the testimonies of the Spirit is leavening our churches everywhere. So what is the cause back in 1882 for the church turning her back from following Christ her leader and instead of going back to Egypt? What is it? It's not rejecting the testimonies, but what? Doubt and disbelief. So even doubt, even doubt, now, I'm not saying it's doubting when somebody produces a statement that says, this is from the spirit of prophecy. Well, I have to verify that it is. <laughs> okay. And like I said, sometimes I have to verify the original because sometimes you take a half a sentence here and a half a sentence there, put them together. You can say almost anything you want to say. But I'm saying when you take a look at the original statement, and if you disregard that or if you doubt the original statement, then what is that? that is causing us to turn away from following Christ our leader and steadily retreating towards Egypt. It goes on. Satan would have it thus. Ministers who preach what? When a minister is no longer interested in preaching the spirit of prophecy, what are they preaching? When a mi Satan would have it thus. Ministers who preach self instead of Christ would have it thus. 
How many times I had ministers tell me, you should not preach the spirit of prophecy from the pulpit. <coughs> and then what? And then I hear him quote Shakespeare. And then I hear him quote Plato and Socrates and all the rest. All the rest of those pagan authors. And you can quote that. You can quote the rubbish of the world. And we cannot quote the light from God. Something is a little bit wrong here. What's wrong? It's self. Ministers who preach self instead of Christ would have it thus. The testimonies are what? Unread and unappreciated. Are we reading the testimonies? Are we actually going to understand that? We often talk about the power of the early church. And sometimes we even talk about the power of the early reformers. What was the power of the early reformers? I saw it when I went to Ukraine. I saw the power. You know what it was? Can you imagine no spirit of prophecy? Can you imagine no spirit of prophecy? And someone gets a spirit of prophecy, and they translate it into Russian. And then what do they do? They uh, take it on a typewriter. So you want a book in Russian? You want a, you want a book back then? You want a spirit of prophecy book? You get a book. You get yourself a typewriter, which is illegal. And then you sit there, and you put a pillow on your, on your, on your uh, knees, and you lock all the doors and windows, close up all the lights, make sure there's no noise out there, and you start typing. And you have about 10 of those carbon copies. And I saw a book over there. It was like the 10th copy, okay? The one, of the one on the back over there. And you know what they were doing with this book? They bind this book together, and you know how precious it is, precious it is to them? Now, that's what we're talking about, the power of the early reformers. They were willing to risk their life to type out. Can you imagine not just buying a book, but actually typing it out for yourself? You want a copy? Type it out. Yeah, you, do you understand that? There was some real precious understanding of these testimonies. And today what? We can buy them by the hundreds. We have our shelf full of them nicely there. You know, I, I uh, go into somebody's house, you know, brand new, you open it up, and you can hear the binding crack. It's like the first time you're opening it in your life. I've even had places where I asked them, oh, by the way, uh, can I read this book here? You know, I said, yeah, sure, I have it, you know, and you have to first unwrap the binding, you know. Are, are, where are we going? The testimonies are unrendered and appreciated. God has spoken to you. Light has been shining from his word and from the testimonies, and both have been slighted and disregarded. The result is apparent in the lack of purity and devotion and earnest faith among us. Someone says, I want to have more faith. Well, start reading. That's what you do, start reading. You know, when I started reading, it changed my life. I mean, I was uh, 14 years old. I gave my heart to the Lord, and I tell you what, I started reading that stuff. I mean, it changed my life, my whole direction of life. The plans, everything, all my plans, my education, my time, everything changed. Why? Because of those testimonies. And brethren, until you and I get onto this thing, we're going to be here for a long time. <coughs> and call ourselves whatever we want to. We're going to be here for a long time. Now, either we're going to be serious or we're not. So now... At this moment here, I would, would like to cover some objections that, have hap that I've come across <laughs> over the years, some very important issues in regard to the spirit of prophecy, that we've got to take a look at some Bible verses. The first one I want to look at is Revelation 22, 18 and 19. It's very important to take a look at this. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 states, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. I remember I was in Temple Hills, Maryland, the worker over there when I first heard this objection. And they told me, see, it says here, do not add. That means when the book of Revelation was closed, that's the end of the Bible. No more additions to the Bible. No more spirit of prophecy. Prophecy came to an end. And I took a look at this verse, and it's like, Lord, what do I do with this verse? I have no idea. But you know what? Around that time, in our home, I was married at the time, and we had decided that part of our worship service was going to be to the read the Bible all the way through as a family. Well, family, my wife and I. 
So we began reading from Genesis to Revelation. That was our goal. Let's read it together as a family. And any one of you as a family, if you've never done this, I think it's really time to begin to start right from the beginning. You know, we talk about ourselves as Bible believers. We didn't even read the Bible yet. Yeah, I've been to people. I've talked to different individuals. Oh, you're a Bible teacher. Wonderful. Have you read the Bible through? Oh, well, uh, parts of it. Well, how can you be a Bible teacher? And you haven't read the whole thing through. That should be one of our first things to do in life. Now, as we were going through it, we were just after, it was, the <laughs> God is so good. I mean, this is like about three, four days later. This wasn't even a long time later. We were in Deuteronomy, and I came to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And as we began reading Deuteronomy chapter 4, I mean, I read the first two verses, and I jumped off the chair. I said, wow, this is wonderful. I was like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> Look at this. Listen to this. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Ye shall not add unto the words which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that ye may keep all the commandments of the Lord your God which I commanded you. Do you understand what this verse says? It is exactly the same as what? As Revelation. In reality, if Revelation means no more prophets, then Deuteronomy means what? No more prophets. And what are we going to do with Isaiah? Exactly. This verse was the key. You see, the Bible explains itself. And this verse shows that it's saying, do not change what is written here. It never said there's no more prophets to come. Right here in Deuteronomy, if we accept that no more prophets should come after a statement like this, then we have to become like the Samaritans. The Samaritans believed only in the first five books. That's it. They never accepted the rest of the prophecies. That's it, this one here, and in one place they actually had to change it because their, their, their temple was in the wrong mountain. It was the mountain of cursing, so they had to change that around a little bit. They couldn't get the other. The other one was in Judah, so therefore they couldn't get that mountain. So, <laughs> brethren, no. This simply means do not change the teachings of truth. And so therefore, in my Revelation 22, I actually put this verse. When I read it for the first time, I put it right there in Revelation. Right there, I wrote it down there, and ever afterwards, it was very helpful to me. So now, for that reason, instead of that meaning no more prophets, let's look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 32. What it actually teaches both in Revelation and in Deuteronomy, is that the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, right? What does that mean? That means that I cannot be a Muslim. Do you know why? What is the understanding of Muslims? What is the big difference between us and Muslims? It's our understanding of prophets. Did you know that? Their belief is that the last prophet corrects all previous prophets. Yeah. The last one corrects previous ones. To where this teaches what? When you understood Moses to be the true prophet, Isaiah comes on the line. What do you do with Isaiah? That's the Muslim way of thinking. However, in this way, what do you do? You test what? The new prophet by the old one. Because the old one's established. You know that one. So before this new one can be accepted, you accept. Obviously, you understand the old one. Then you test the new one by the old one. OK? So now Daniel comes on the scene. So what do you do? You test Daniel by what? By Moses and Isaiah. Right? Uh, there's many others. I'm just using the ones. Okay. Now, John comes on the scene. What do you do? That's right. So you test him by Moses, Isaiah, and Daniel. Right? So now, after John, comes another prophet, Ellen G. White. So what do you do? You test Ellen G. White by Moses, Isaiah, Daniel, and John. Right? And now a new prophet shows up. What do you do? 
You test a new one by what? By Moses, Isaiah, Daniel, John, and Ellen G. White. That's it. You don't sit here and disregard any of that. So when it says here, the spirit of the prophets, so any prophet today is subject. It is not above. It is actually subject to what? To those prophets that have been accepted. And this is very key. Even in Adventism, I've met prophets. And I met one person that in their book, this one corrects Sister White. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. I met that. Yes. It doesn't work that way. This one actually is tested by all previous prophets. It's an important principle. So Revelation 22 is not saying that there's no more prophets. Instead, it says what? That any prophet that comes and changes anything of the previous prophets, they are false. According to this. Is that clear? That clear? All right. Another one. Another one that I was really shocked, and I tell you what, it, when I first heard this, actually it was in the same meeting I heard a whole bunch of these objections. And I was like, really? I was a young worker. I, I had not, I wasn't prepared for all this stuff. But I was prepared to go back and study, okay? And I thank the Lord that somehow in the next few weeks I found all this material and, and, and was able to understand it, including like Deuteronomy. Now it says here, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So what is given by inspiration of God? All scripture. So a person told me that means... The writing of Ellen G. White is not scripture, therefore, it's worth nothing. But now you know. I don't know why I didn't think of it right then, but when I was studying a little bit later on, I read this. And do you know what actually this says? All scripture is given by inspiration. Do you know what it says actually here? Do you understand the meaning here? What is scripture? Written, Written but what, which one? What is it? What is it talking about when it says scriptures? Okay, but let's, let's go direct. First of all, you're going through the uh, secondary application. Let's go to the primary application here. But what is scripture? <laughs> that, that's it. Listen here. When Paul wrote this, the only scriptures was the Old Testament. There was no New Testament. It didn't exist. He was just writing you Timothy, okay? So, okay, Timothy, this is the last one he's writing, okay? But nonetheless, when Paul was about to be executed in 2 Timothy, the scriptures at that time was the Old Testament. And I'll explain to you what the New Testament was in a moment. However, we apply this to everything, okay? So now, if Paul was intending to mean that all scripture meant only the Old Testament, then he would have stopped right there. He wouldn't have continued any further. Why did he finish a little bit more in, in, in 2 Timothy? Why did he write a bit more? Because, notice 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? Now, how did the early Christian church regard the writings of Paul and other prophets? I want you to pay attention here. This is 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received what? The, 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 the what? The word of God, which you heard of, of us as prophets, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you to believe. So what was the writing of Paul? The Word of God. But it wasn't Scripture. <laughs> when Paul says Scripture, he meant Old Testament. But what was this? The writings of the prophets in his time. What is it called still? The Word of God. You know, when, when the apostles and the early Christians, they went from place to place, 
Do you know what they had? They had their Bible, and they had their spirit of prophecy books. Did you know that? Yeah, Tim, First Thessalonians at that time was the spirit of prophecy. Yeah, it, it was. That's a fact. They did not. They, that was not Bible. It was spirit of prophecy. And by the way, that spirit of prophecy was not second class. It was never a second class to the Old Testament. What was it? It was the Word of God. In other words, it's the same thing. It's the same thing of prophecy. Now, I want you to pay attention to 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Why do I say it was their spirit of prophecy? It's very important here to understand. When they conducted evangelistic meetings in the early Christian church, what did they use? Hmm? No, when they conducted evangelistic meeting, what did they use? Old Testament. Look at this. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for whom? For them that believe. You know, when they went to preach to the Jews, they didn't go there and say, well, Paul says this, and it's written in Mark that. No. What did they do? They used the scriptures. They preached from the scriptures. That's why you see Paul in Romans. He says, Isaiah says this, Hosea says that. Isn't that what it says? Mm -hmm. He doesn't say Mark said this and James says that. Why? Because Mark and James and Paul were for the church. They were the spirit of prophecy for those that believe. And when we go out there doing evangelism, we have to understand our audience. If you go preaching to the Jewish church today, you don't go use the Old Testament. Who, what do you use? You have to use the Old Testament. You can't sit there and say it says in John and Revelation and all this stuff. That's not, that doesn't work. You got to use the Old Testament. You use the New Testament only to those that believe the New Testament. Now what happens when you meet New Testament Christians? What do you do then? You don't use the Old Testament. You understand that? We're trying to reach the world. And these, to some things, that's Bible and that's spirit of prophecy. And we use it. The spirit of prophecy is only for those who believe. Now, we as a church believe in what? Spirit of prophecy. So what can we do? Freely use it. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because it's for whom? For the church. So when somebody says, oh, you can't preach from the spirit of prophecy here? Well, in this church, what can I say? It's for the church. Now, whoever the church is, it's for them. Okay? So if I can't preach it in this church over here, that means they are not what? They're not the church. <laughs> it's very simple. If I can't use the spirit of prophecy in this place, it means they're not the church because this testimony is only for whom? It's for the church. It's for believers. That means those who do not accept the spirit of prophecy, they are? Very clear, isn't it? That's what it says right there. So now, in volume one testing for the church, it's a very important statement. Keep in mind, this is the time when the prophetess was alive. She is dead today, so we have a chance to evaluate it fully. But now, even while she was alive, I want you to notice the statement here. And again, sometimes people make a mistake by reading only part of the statement. Here's what it says. Some I was shown could receive the published visions, judging over the tree by its fruits. Others are like doubting Thomas. They cannot believe the published testimonies, nor receive evidence through the testimony of others, but must see and have the evidence for themselves. Right? So they are different classes of people. Such must not be set aside, but long patience and brotherly love should be exercised towards them until they find their position and become established for or against. Doesn't mean they stay there forever, but what? They eventually establish their position, right? Now, notice this now. But now, what happens if this group, 
if they fight against the visions of which they have no knowledge, if they carry their opposition so far as to oppose that in which they have had no experience, and feel annoyed when those who believe that the visions are of God speak of them where? In meetings. And comfort themselves with the instruction given through vision. The church may know they are not right. Is that clear? So if somebody's having questions, whatever, that's one thing. But if they oppose, the moment they oppose, that means what? They are in the wrong. The church may understand now they are not right. Be why? Because we should feel free. And notice the next part here. God's people should not cringe and yield and give up their liberties to such disaffected ones. In our church, we, if some, we should not cringe to use the spirit of prophecy. Why? Because it's given for the church. If this is the church, we don't cringe. Now, if this is not the church of God, then you better start cringing anyway. God has placed the gifts in the church that the church may be benefited by them. And when professed believers in the truth oppose these gifts and fight against the visions, souls are in danger through their influence. And it is time then to labor with them that the weak may not be led astray by their influence. We cannot afford such individuals in the church to lead astray those who are weak. If you leave such individuals in the church, they will discourage the weak and they will be lost. And who will be responsible for that? Therefore, we have to be very firm on this whole issue. So as the early Christian church, they were very clear on it, right? So the scriptures, Old Testament, was for whom? When they did evangelism and all these things, that's what they used. But in the church, they freely quoted from what? From their spirit of prophecy. Now later on, that spirit of prophecy was by the Christians added as part of the Bible. Why? How can they add now to the scriptures? Because the spirit of prophecy is subject to the prophets. They're the same. They were no different. You see, the fact is, when they identified that these prophets, because by the way, the Old Testament is what? What is the Old Testament? It's the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> you know, when you read Isaiah 8, 20. It says, to the law and to the testament. What is the testimony? Spirit of prophecy. And what was it back then? They're not talking about LNG White then specifically. They're talking about what? The rest. So you have the law, which is the Torah, the five books of Moses. That's the law. And the rest of it is what? It's the testimony. It's the spirit of prophecy. That's what it is. The whole thing is the spirit of prophecy. So when you're reading Isaiah, what are you reading? What are you reading? Spirit of prophecy. That's what you're reading. But what happens is they've been tested. They became firm. And now it's part of the, what we call the Bible. And then when the New Testament came around, after a while, what happened? That spirit of prophecy was recognized as what? Firmly the same spirit. Therefore, it's part of the Bible. It's the same thing. Only difference is, is who your audience is. For us as believers, it's all the same. The spirit of prophecy and the Torah are equal, isn't it? The only thing that's different among it all is the uninspired part of the Torah. Right? Remember last night? Y'all remember? The, un the part that was never inspired by God, never was given by inspiration of God? What is it? Ten Commandments. God did not inspire a person to get it. What did God do? He came down and wrote it with his own finger. <laughs> okay. So that part was not inspired. That part is different to any other part of the other thing. Everything else was given somehow through what? Spirit of prophecy. But a lot of the book of Moses was not given by spirit of prophecy. Moses went up the mountain and talked to God face to face. Okay, Didn't need inspiration. That's why it's called the law. Why? Because Moses heard it directly from God. The rest of it, the Old Testament, the rest of the Old Testament is all spirit of prophecy. The New Testament, what is it? Spirit of prophecy. And if people are having a problem with the spirit of prophecy today, they're going to have a problem with what? The whole Bible. And it was interesting one day. I was just beginning working in Washington, D.C. And uh, a friend of mine, he, went me to, he took me to visit a Seventh-day Adventist family. 
And as we were going there, he told me, uh, be careful. This family does not accept the spirit of prophecy. The first thing that came to my mind is, do they accept the Bible? And he said, of course they do. Come on, what kind of question is that? Anyway, we got into their apartment. We got to visiting and talking with them a little bit. And the lady sits there, and she's finally asked me a question. She says, you know, I have a question for you. She says, you know, in the Genesis, when it says that God says this to Abraham and whatnot, I said, yeah. She says, how do we know that God actually really told Abraham that? What was going on? Got in the Bible. Why? Because they were diving into the whole thing of prophets. You don't stop with this prophet. If it's the same inspiration, you start rejecting the whole thing because it's the same spirit. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophet. So if it's the same spirit, you're going to reject all those with the same spirit, which is what? The entire thing. OK, I thought I got through that one. Then I hear another one. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God who in sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So when did God speak through prophets? In time past. And the next verse says um, that now he speaks through Jesus Christ. So they told me, okay, that means the Old Testament is accept you know, God spoke in time past to the prophets, and that means after, then Christ came, and that's it. No one needed prophets. And I asked him, then do you accept the New Testament? I told the person, look, if you really believe this, you're going to actually become a Jew. And you know, a couple months later, I found that they joined the Jewish synagogue. <laughs> a Christian. Here's a Christian. Because they would rather reject the prophets and go back to Judaism rather than recognize what they're reading here. You know, who established prophets in the last days? 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, And God had set some in the church. First apostle, secondarily what? Secondarily who? Prophet. Who put them in the church? God. And so God put apostles in the church. Why is it that we accept apostles, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of signs? We accept all that, but we don't accept the prophets. Why is that? I don't understand that. God put them in there. That means that in the New Testament times, God reestablished. So Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, yes, God spoke in time past to the prophets, then now spoke to Jesus through Jesus Christ, and then after Jesus Christ, what did God do? Reestablish communication through whom? Through prophets. Right there. It's a very clear statement. Let's skip over some of this here. Basically, this is going through that the only one that doesn't need prophets is the Catholic Church, is what it's going through there. Um, the uh, Catholic Church has no need of prophets. Do you know why? They speak God, di God directly, because God is the Pope. So when you have God now, you don't need prophets anymore. So they're the only ones that r got rid of prophets. To us, we don't have God on earth yet like that, so therefore we have prophets. That's what it's going through there. Is there ever going to be a time when we don't need prophets anymore? Let's take a look. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12. Charity never faileth, so love will never fail. But whether there be prophecies, they shall what? Fail or come to an end. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is part, in part, shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For we now see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I also am known. There is going to come a time when we do not need prophecy. When is that? In this context. When Jesus comes again, we don't need prophecies. We don't need faith either. Why? Because you see him face to face. So when you see Christ face to face, it's no longer by faith. You actually see the thing. That's it. That's, it. That's the end of faith. So prophecy and faith are no longer needed at that time. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and 3, and I'm going to use the NIV just a little bit here. 
uh, the same statement here. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. That's what Paul says. And then the next verse is back to King James. But he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and to comfort. So the purpose of prophecy is for what? Exhortation, edification, and comfort. Do you need comfort? I tell you, many times in my life, when difficult times come, what do we do? Some people cry and spend all their time weeping and crying and moaning and groaning and everything else. When difficult time comes, I dig out Desire of Ages and I start reading the last 10 chapters. Kind of put things in perspective. You see, when you think everybody beat me up and I'm in a big sh sad shape and the whole world is falling down, you start reading what happened to Christ and you think, well, actually, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> you know, everything's really good around here. You know, what Christ did for me and was willing to do for me, if I can have that spirit, then I have a long way yet to go and I, I can be encouraged. And I tell you, many times even I've even began to lose my Christian experience, even as a worker. You know, sometimes you get so busy working for the Lord like the devil that you lose your Christian experience. And so what happens? On those days, those dark, gloomy days when I felt that the whole world has come to an end. I uh, remember living in Temple Hills, Maryland. I was still single at the time. And one time I really gave up. That was it. I'm finished with this work. I'm finished with everything. I'm going back to building. I'll go back to my hammer. And um, after a month of misery, I went out to the backwoods. Back then, those of you who live in Temple Hills, actually there was no houses back there at the time. Uh, the, the road came to an end back there and actually there was at that time uh, at the cul-de-sac at the end you can go down below and there was a river at that time back there um, and I went going for a walk in those woods and you know after about an hour walking I realized you know there is a God in heaven that loves each one of us and I knelt down there and regave my heart to the Lord and I tell you, if we can only understand Calvary it will all be put in perspective and this is why what it says here <coughs> that he that prophesied speaking of the mental edification, exhortation, and comfort. We need comfort. Every one of us needs comfort. Every one of us go through dark days. Every one of us go through miserable times in our life. And what do we need then? And so where do we get it? The spirit of prophecy. You see, that's the thing. <coughs> that's where we get it. What about if we need exhortation? Do we know we need exhortation sometimes? You know, someone, no one, sometimes no one can tell us anything, you know. Uh, sometimes you tell people, oh, you can't say anything to them because they'll wither and die, you know. And yeah, they're so sensitive. But what should the sensitive people do? <coughs> they need exhortation, so what do they need to do? Read the Spirit of Prophecy. You'll get plenty of it. Okay. All these things we need, and we get it right there in the Spirit of Prophecy. And we need it until Christ returns, because that which is perfect is not yet come. Instead of Rejecting prophets, the same Apostle Paul who says all these things about prophets says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. And remember, we, we read last night from Greenfield's lexicon, it actually means despise not the gift of prophesying, remember? Instead, do what? Hold fast that, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, yes? Well, the, the, as we mentioned now, the spirit of prophecy is everything outside the Torah. That means Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the law. Okay, because most of it was given by God to Moses almost face, well, he says face to face, right? Uh, he says Moses is not just a prophet. He says God speaks to him face to face. That's in Exodus. The rest of the Bible is what? The spirit of prophecy. That's what it is. Okay, now some things are made a little bit more for our time through the writings of Ellen G. White. But what I'm saying here is we need to get back into the reading of the prophets. And that includes all the prophets, not just Old Testament prophets, not just New Testament prophets, but even the prophets that we have today. Because that's where we get comfort and strength. Now here, Paul says what? This prove all things. Instead of despising the gift of prophecy, you do what? You test the prophets. And we have an obligation to test the prophets. Matthew 24, 24 is another very important statement talking about the second coming of Christ. In the last days what shall there arise? For there shall arise false Christ. Now what does it mean false Christ? I want you to understand this. When it says there shall arise false Christ, indirectly what does that mean? A little bit beyond. I'm thinking of more than that. The word false Christs 
Now, does that mean that there is no Christ because there are false Christs? Is that what it means? No, in comparison, what do you have? You have false Christ, and then you have what? The real Christ, right? Now, notice in this context, and false what? False prophet. What does that mean? <laughs> There's true prophets. This is talking about the last days. So if we think that, oh, false prophets means there's no prophets at all, then there's no Christ at all. This is really dangerous. In reality, there's false Christ because there's a true Christ. There's false prophets because there are true prophets. And these false ones shall do all these to deceive, if possible, the very elect. But the very elect will not be deceived. You know why the very elect will not be deceived? Huh? They know the real one. They know the real one. Yeah, that's right. They know the real Christ, and they know the real prophets. So therefore, they're not going to get deceived. It's very simple. All we have to do is follow that, and God will bless us. Instead, we need to test the prophets. By what? Remember we read last night, by their fruits ye shall know them. This is the whole context here. I'm not going to read the whole thing here, just the last part. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. This is what you do. You test the prophets by their fruits. And what does it mean? Uh, to test the prophets by their fruits. In volume 4, page 311 says, the deeds of a man's life are the fruit he bears. So what we have to do is look at what? The deeds of the life. If he is unfaithful and dishonest in temporal matters, he is bringing forth briars and thorns, he'll be unfaithful in the religious life and will rob God in tithes and offerings. Now, I know that's not our topic, but that's another aspect of it, so just keep that in mind. But the fact is, the deeds of a person's life. So this afternoon, we've looked at one major thing. When we talk about the omega of apostasy, what are we talking about? Clearly. What is it? Make of none effect the testimony. That is the omega. That's the last one. That's the final test for Seventh-day Adventists. There is no other test beyond that. <coughs> There's not going to be something. If we reject the spirit of prophecy, that's our final test. Okay. Now, then we looked at various scriptural passages that people have used over the years to kind of tell us that there is no prophets after the New Testament. However, if you compare scripture with scripture, they answer themselves. They're very clear comparing one passage to another passage. So every one of us today need to really seriously make a decision. The decision is, what is our attitude towards the spirit of prophecy? Now, by the way, I don't want to finish on this note. That's why we have the next topic is, I would be like Jesus. It's a very important aspect because if we want to be saved in the kingdom of God, we need to be like whom? How do we get to be like Jesus? How is that possible? Well, we'll have to leave that for the next topic because we, need, we have some more information to share with you on that. But there is something that we have to decide on the writings of Ellen G. White right now. In Volume 4, Testament for the Church, page 229 to 230 says, We have warned of dangers as God has presented before us the perils of his people. Our work has been given us of God. What then will be the condition of those who refuse to hear the words which God has sent them because they cross their track or reprove their wrongs? What's going to happen to someone if, if they reject the spirit of prophecy because it came across their pathway? If this is from God, then what's going to happen to them? If you are thoroughly, listen, listen carefully here. You know, sometimes we think, oh, we can have all sorts of beliefs. No, no. If you are thoroughly convinced that God has not spoken to, by us, why not act in accordance with your faith and have no more to do with the people who are under so great deception as are these people? If you really think that the spirit of prophecy is wrong, then you need to leave away from God's people because th these people are deluded. You don't make compromise with such people to keep them in the church. There has to be what? A separation here. Those who don't believe in the spirit of prophecy cannot be in the church. Why? Because the spirit of prophecy is given for what? It's given for the church. And if you don't accept it, then you don't belong in this church. If you have been moving according to the dictates of the Spirit of God, you are right and we are wrong. It's very simple. There's no gray matter. This is right or wrong. God is either teaching his church, reproving their wrongs, and strengthening their faith, or he is not. This work is of God or it is not. God does nothing in partnership with Satan. Do we understand this? There's no partnership here. 
My work for the past 30 years bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. There is no halfway work in the matter. The testimonies are of the Spirit of God or of the devil. That clear? That's it. In arraying yourself against the servants of God, you are doing a work either for God or for the devil. By their fruits you shall know them. What stamp does your work bear? It will pay to look critically at the results of your course. Instead of deciding to make all these decisions on the spirit of prophecy, it's time for us to examine our own fruits. Question is, here's the last verse again. Three times in a row, it's the same one. I, I go back to the time of Jehoshaphat. This is such an important verse. It says here, And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so ye shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. The question I have for you today, do you want to be part of the omega of apostasy, or do you want spiritual prosperity? Amen. Let, let's sing hymn number 291, Standing on the Promises.